Take us away. It's Jackie Ogis, just to clarify that. <laughs> um, good afternoon. Um, I'll be presenting on the Institute's inclusion of women and minorities in clinical studies for fiscal years 2013 and 2014. So I'll give a brief history of the NIH-wide mandate to report enrollment. I'll provide a few definitions that we used in writing our biennial report. I'll explain the exclusion of enrollment data from our largest funded study, 23andMe. And finally, I'll discuss uh, the NHGRI's enrollment data and analyses for fiscal years 2013 and 2014. So as we all know, um, increasing enrollment of women and minorities in clinical research is scientifically important. Um, and responding to a lack of population diversity in clinical research, uh, Congress passed the NIH Revitalization Act of 1993, which requires all institutes to report enrollment every two years. Um, and this includes uh, data from intramural and extramural research programs. And this ensures that all ICs are in compliance with the NIH inclusion guidelines and allows us to look back and observe trends in enrollment over time across the institutes. Um, and all investigators are required to report enrollment unless they're exempted in cases such as small sample size or duplicate reporting. Um, and program officers and review staff keep track of the target or proposed data that PIs submit in their um, progress reports and their applications. But for our biennial report, we looked at actual enrollment data. These numbers are cumulative, meaning that tracking begins at the start of the project's funding period. So the NIH inclusion guidelines define a minority group as a readily identifiable subset of the U.S. population that's distinguishable by racial, ethnic, and or cultural heritage. And a significant difference is what we're looking for in increasing enrollment of women and minorities is a difference that is of clinical or public health importance. And for the purposes of our biennial report, we defined a protocol as a single grant or IRB approved project. And uh, the protocol is what we use to group and simplify our enrollment numbers by project. And when PIs submit their enrollment data to the institute, they populate tables similar to this one here. They break down their enrollment into ethnic, racial, and gender categories. And these, these categories are set by the U.S. Census. So for most studies um, funded by NHGRI, participants self-report their race, ethnicity, and gender. Um, but for our largest funded study, 23andMe, in which close to 580,000 participants are enrolled in a large online study, um, these data are collected differently in that first the data are collected online and about 30 percent of participants did not report their race. Um, for participants who did not specifically identify as Hispanic, investigators assumed that they were not Hispanic. And then gender was determined by genetic data as opposed to self-reporting. So when we added in the 23andMe numbers, um, we saw that uh, our proportions of unknown, unknown race were uh, significantly skewed. And so we tended to exclude these numbers from our analyses and reported them separately. So from FY13 to 14, I show ERP here without 23andMe data. We had 50 protocols involving close to 240,000 participants. IRP had 94 protocols with 65,000 participants. And across the institute, there was a total of 144 protocols for comprising a total enrollment of about 300,000 participants. And sorting these protocols by sample size, about 60 protocols had a sample size below 100 participants, um, and another 60 had a sample size between 100 and 600. Fewer protocols had uh, larger sample sizes um, and IRP had a higher proportion of protocols um, with smaller sample sizes. And again, th these exclude 23andMe. So breaking down our enrollment 
by racial categories. I show here IRP data, I mean ERP, um, excluding 23andMe. A little bit more than half of our participants identify as white, and about a fifth of our participants identify as black or African American. Fewer participants identify as uh, members of other minority groups, and we see here about 9% of our participants um, report unknown race, or unknown in terms of race. And when we investigated that further, we saw that there were three studies that seemed to skew these numbers and led to a higher proportion of unknown race. There was one study in which race and ethnicity were combined as one variable, and then there were two studies in which um, Hispanic participants did not report race. And investigators for these studies explained that um, participants who identify as Hispanic, um, particularly recent immigrants, um, they're less familiar with the U.S. Census categories and therefore declined to report uh, their race being, um, and declined to define themselves in those terms. And looking at IRP, we had a slightly higher proportion of participants being white, and in both ERP and IRP, we have about a fifth of our participants um, identifying as black or African American, and a smaller proportion of participants um, were of unknown race. And here we have 16% um, identifying their ethnicity as Hispanic, and 4% of unknown ethnicity. And in IRP, we had about 3% identifying Hispanic and 2% of unknown ethnicity. And in ERP, we have a, high, a majority of our participants identifying as female. And in IRP, about 51% 50 um, identifying as male with 5% unknown gender. So as you remember, we, ten, we treated 23andMe data separately. So I show it here. 58% um, of participants identify as white, and about a third of these participants um, identify as unknown race or did not report their race for reasons explained earlier. And as a reference, I show ERP excluding the 23andMe data. There's a slightly lower proportion of participants who are white and much greater proportion of participants um, who, are, who identify as black. And there is a 9% um, unknown race as opposed to 30%. And here, 11% um, in 23andMe 23 um, identify Hispanic in the city. And that's compared to 16% in ERP. And a greater proportion of male participants in 23andMe as opposed to a majority of female participants in ERP. And tracking enrollment and, and putting together these reports every two years allows us to look at trends in enrollment over time. Um, and we see here, I've grouped the, uh, I've grouped 2010 data in the blue column, 2011 to 2012 data in the red column, and then 2013 and 2014 in these two columns, um, this is excluding. 23andMe data, and this is including 23andMe data, and I compare all of these to the 2010 census data. Um, we see a slight decrease in the proportion of white participants, and this is below the U.S. Census, and we see a slight increase um, in the proportion of black participants, and this is higher than the U.S. Census. We see no major trends um, in the proportion of participants identifying as Asian, and we have been trying to reduce uh, the number of unknowns in all, across all of these categories, but we see an increase in the number of unknown race in, in this chart here. Um, this is something that we recognize, and this is something that we will continue to, to address going forward. And also, these categories below um, are 
the groups in which we saw major trends in enrollment. And here we see an increase in the uh, proportion of Hispanic participants in our, in, in our studies and a decrease in the number of unknowns in terms of ethnicity. And an increase in the number of female participants and if we add in 23andMe, we see a, a slight increase in the, part, in the proportion of males. So in summary, um, NHGRI has increased the enrollment of minority and women, um, minorities and women in fiscal years 2013 and 2014. Um, and in comparison to the 2010 U.S. Census, um, it, was, it was able to increase the population diversity of its cohorts. Um, because race, ethnicity, and gender were reported differently by 23andMe, we tended to exclude these numbers from our analyses and reported them separately. And uh, the high proportion of unknown race for ERP is due to the collecting of race and ethnicity in a single item or Hispanic participants declining to report race. Thank you. Uh, council reviewers are uh, Drs. Borwinkle and Hughes Halbert. Um, Dr. Dr. Borwinkle. First, thank you for making the report on our behalf. I didn't realize that uh, little entity. And also, congratulations on the trends, both to you and the community. I think it's a, a real win because the community realizes that diversity is important, not just for social reasons, but also scientific reasons. And I, I think that's great. I, one technical comment, I, I would advise that we don't report data and have sentences that focus on 23andMe. I, I would think we would focus on NHGRI with and without 23andMe and not have anything about just 23andMe. I don't think it's um, helpful. And I'm not sure it's appropriate. So that's my that's my opinion. So for example, table two B I would eliminate. So but was twenty three and me funded by NHGRI? Yes. And what was the purpose of the project? But I think if we go down that route, we need an appendix then about every project. I'm just I'm 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 balking at showing the data from a single project. So if I could just comment. Eric, the reason we, we did that was because it was so large. It's, it's three times larger than any others. But, but your point is well taken, and we'll just do with and without with that. With and without. So I, I agree, I mean, um, with everything that Eric has said. Um, one observation that I thought of as you were presenting, I mean, just thinking about some of the comments made earlier today about, you know, what our experience has been with um, limited racial and ethnic diversity in samples, um, it's significant that, you know, about 20 percent of the uh, individuals who've been enrolled are from um, African Americans. And I just wondered if that's due to a, uh, a, a, a select number of studies that have a specific focus on racial and ethnic minorities, or if that 20 percent is distributed across all of the projects. So one study, for instance, I'm just thinking, so you could think about is it that, I don't know, one study is able to have like a, a racially diverse um, sample, or is it that you have one study that enrolled 2,000 African Americans and that's included in um, your, your percentages? That's a good question. The 20 percent of African Americans is not in restricted to the one or two studies that's across all the studies correct not every study but not every study but it's almost across all the studies we so, don't have a specific the cohort or studies that exclusively recruit African America so I guess I would just push back a bit I mean the, in one of the slides you know I had a study that was funded maybe in 2011 2012 that only recruited African Americans and so we didn't have any, um, any whites, any uh, Asian Americans. And so, you know, we, I mean, I think in that we included 1,000 people, um, which, I, which is, you know, substantial. I'm not saying that our study, like, did all the, did the heavy lifting here. But I do think it's worthwhile to maybe um, 
um, I would just be curious to see the, the sort of the distribution across studies and if that 20 percent holds up across all groups. Yeah, that's a very good point. And that's a good example for next year, we, next time we will report the, uh, the data. Actually, for the intramural, we have one study, that's Dr. Gary Gibbons' study. His study is to exclusively recruit African Americans. Yeah, we were incredible information for them. Just speaking for the intramural research program, that, that's one important study that actually the numbers will start to increase. But we do have an, a few studies intramurally. I think it looks a little different than extramural where recruitment was either happening in West Africa and, and persons of African descent in the United States. Um, a few studies of um, things like sickle cell disease where the entire cohort, the, the disease is occurring because of founder mutations or the reasons in certain populations. So. It looked the numbers are smaller, but that's more likely sure. to be a trend in intramural studies. My comment isn't intended to diminish the significance of what you've shown. I'm just pointing out that I think it's important to um, see across the lay of the land where some investigators are really meeting their accrual goals in terms of enrolling a diverse sample. You can make the same criticism of work that I've done that it wasn't diverse, um, it only included African Americans. So, you know. Again, my comments were more about just being more precise, I think, in, for this committee in terms of understanding the distribution. Thank you. So um, I also want to sort of add my voice to the chorus on seeing the trends going in, in the right direction. I think it would be great if you could make that data available for other people who are interested in, in looking at it. In particular, I had exactly the same kind of questions that I wanted to sort of ask about. And I'd love to see sort of study total number of individuals, you know, broken up by um, race, ethnicity. It'd be good to know whether it's sort of like an eMERGE study or if it's a study that's got uh, genotype data, exome data, full genome data, all those sorts of details I think people are going to be really, really interested in. Mm -hmm. And I was curious in particular about PAGE and how much PAGE contributed to that because, you know, PAGE is 50,000 people specifically, you know, geared towards, you know, non-European populations. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so I was, I was curious about how much of this was driven by a couple of large studies that were doing multi-ethnic and then the, the rest, you know, sort of being more of the, where we've invested in the past. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we can show you uh, the breakdown of those numbers. Um, we have that collected. But yeah, I mean, it would be great to make it available. I mean, you know, I think it's one of those things that people are really interested in and, and when people you know, like me harp on and say, oh, you know, 95% of the studies are in populations of European descent. And, you know, Terry's called me on it a couple times. Oh, it's gotten better. And look at this. And here are the, you know, the numbers. And so if you guys really make those numbers available, I think it would just be really, really useful for the community so that, you know, we could see where change is happening. You know, one of my biggest worries, for example, is that, um, you know, we're getting better in genotype data, but, you know, the full genome sequence data is, you know, it, you know, the, the trend may be getting even worse, you know. And so the, the, those are the kinds of things that I think would be really useful to, to see, particularly, you know, because you have to report on it uh, on a certain interval of time, but, you know, people want to look at it, you know, much more regularly, I think. Yeah, I think your points are were taken. Yeah, we have that data available in spreadsheet. I think for the report, if people self-identify as being male or female, then you can call that gender. But if you use genomic information, it's sex. Okay. Right. Jen. I'll make that distinction. Yeah. So I, I was just, and maybe you went through this, but I was confused by the fact that Hispanics weren't a designated group in a lot of these. I know there's the issue of the unknown being because of a larger percentage, but the Hispanics are the largest right minority group. Right, and I was just confused as to why I didn't see them broken out in the slide. Yeah, so, is it yeah? Is it within the the it, white? It has to so do. It has to do with the OMB classification. It's very confusing. So you can be a black confusing. Hispanic, you can be a white Hispanic, yeah. right? So those are counted separately. Yeah. It's always confusing to break those out, but it seems like it might be important to try to dissect. Well, out. so but they are broken out, Jim. So so it's just that we do race and then we do ethnicity. Okay. And they, and they are two separate things, okay. except for one very large study which collected historically as a single combined, combined variable. Okay. okay. So I'm just 
curious, in, in the instruments that collect these data, can individuals identify in multiple categories simultaneously? I think there is one category to record multiple race. Yeah. So one category for yeah. multi race. Yeah, multi race for that category. Okay. Is I didn't see that number reported on here. Is that was it there? there if you look in the pie charts, more than one race is, is the option. Yeah. yeah. Or orange. orange. Okay. Yeah. And um, the other thing I'm interested in, it's not required, but the age trends, is that is the age of the participants collected in, and are the age trends in these studies also matching the U.S. Census in some regard? You don't collect, you don't collect it? No. Not through this mechanism. Okay. I just wonder, because in the, in the document background, of it, policy applies to research subjects of all ages in all NIH funded clinical research studies. So I was interested that age isn't tracked at all. And is that going to be something that's important in the future to track? Yeah, for the future track, do we have as an aging now? person. Based on peer review, it's just child or adult. Yeah. So it's are you 21 years of age or older, you're an adult. If you're below 21, you're a child. It's not binned. And the study's trying to The data that are collected come from that enrollment table, so it's fixed. And it does not include age, even though you may have a pediatric study, it doesn't show up any different from if there are adults in the study. Is it from the target enrollment table or actual enrollment table? From the actual enrollment table, inclusion table. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Uh, can I have a motion to accept the report? Second. All in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Thank you all. Yes, Betty. Microphone. So I'd like to just clarify that what you're voting on is the report that goes to Congress, and separately, you're asking at another time for a progress report on how well we're doing. Because I don't want to conflate. The, the regular report to council with a lot of things, Congress with a lot of things that you want to see. I assume this vote is with taking into account the comments the council gave. We heard those and we will make those changes. <laughs> 